What's up everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. If this is your first time here, my name is Richard and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. Subscribe for all kinds of content just like this and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. This is my statistics tutorial series where I give you all the applied statistics knowledge that you need to conquer the data science world. In my last video in the statistics tutorial series, I outlined the hypothesis testing framework and the various steps that go into these problems. You start by defining a null and alternative hypothesis as well as picking a significance level. Then you calculate a test statistic, which basically summarizes how extreme your data is. You'll use the distribution of that test statistic to calculate a p-value, and then you compare that p-value to your significance level. If the p-value is lower than your significance level, you reject the null hypothesis. If the p-value is higher than the significance level, you will fail to reject the null hypothesis. We need to talk a little bit more about what a p-value actually is because it's one of the absolute most important definitions in all of statistics and it's also one of the most misunderstood and misused. So we're going to go through the definition of what a p-value is, but perhaps more importantly, we're going to step through what a p-value is not. The definition of the p-value of a test is the p-value is the probability that we observe a test statistic as extreme or more extreme than we did, assuming the null hypothesis is true. Now I have a variety of other things which a p-value is not, and these are some of the most common misconceptions of p-values. So a p-value is not the probability we observe a test statistic as or more extreme than we did, leaving out that whole part about the null hypothesis being true. A p-value is not the probability that the null hypothesis is true. A p-value is not proof of anything. And a p-value is not indication of effect size or effect magnitude. Let's start with this first misconception about p-values, which is that p-values are the probability we observe a test statistic as extreme or more extreme than we did. So we're on the right track, but we forget about the whole part about the null hypothesis being true. Now, this is a fairly common thing that people who are just learning statistics for the first time can tend to forget. Let's use the example from my previous video where we pretended to do a sample of 50 people and we found that the average amount of time people spend on their phones in America daily is 3.2 hours from our sample. Now that number, 3.2 hours, was used to calculate a test statistic, but in and of itself, what exactly does taking that sample and finding a mean of 3.2 hours really tell us? Without any prior belief or prior information, like that we expect the population mean average hours to be 3.5 hours, the 3.2 hours number doesn't really mean anything, and there's no real way for us to use that in a probability calculation. It's that initial assumption that we started with, that the population mean is 3.5 hours, that gives that 3.2 hours some kind of context, as well as a basis for us determining whether it's extreme or whether it's something that's expected. So don't forget about that clause about the null hypothesis being true, because it's really that part that gives your entire hypothesis testing problem its required context. I personally really like writing the definition of a p-value out as a conditional probability. So like as the probability you observe a test statistic as or more extreme than you did, given the null hypothesis is true. Moving on to a second common misconception that people can have about p-values. Some people will mistake the p-value as the probability that the null hypothesis is true. And this is another one that comes up a lot with introductory statistics students. Just as a disclaimer, the overwhelming majority of the time when people begin to learn statistics, or even when they think about these concepts like hypothesis testing and p-values in real applied data science work, they are thinking through what's called frequentist statistics, which is separate from what's called Bayesian statistics. These rules are a little bit different under that context, but under a frequentist framework, the probability the null hypothesis is true is either one or zero, because we don't actually know it, but the null hypothesis is either true or it's false, meaning your probability is one or zero. 
The p-value that you calculate is a probability related to the data you collected from your sample and how that relates to the null hypothesis, but the p-value is not a statement about the null hypothesis itself. Now the third misconception of p-values, and this is possibly the most egregious of all of them, is thinking that a p-value proves anything. So before we get into this, we're going to look at this super popular XKCD comic, and it's going to illustrate an idea called p-hacking. Now this is typically when you perform a whole bunch of statistical tests in hope that that one is going to come out which is going to return a statistically significant p-value. So to start off here, we've got some scientists working on some really important things, playing Minecraft, yada yada yada, you know the drill. And they start by finding that based on a p-value of 0.05, that jelly beans are not linked with acne, at least in the aggregate. So then investigators look at 10 different colors of jelly beans, they test all of them, and they find there's no link between them and acne at the 0.05 level. Then they do 10 more tests using different colors, and they still find that there's no link between any of those colored jelly beans and acne. But then lo and behold, they run one more test, and then they find that green jelly beans are significantly linked to acne at the 0.05 level. So great day for the scientists. They can publish their findings and then go back to playing Minecraft, I guess. Here's the thing. If the null hypothesis is true and we treat the p-value just like it's a random variable, it actually follows a uniform 0-1 distribution, meaning yes, there is a 5% chance that by chance alone, you will find a p-value that is less than 0.05. So there's really a couple points here. On one hand, even if the null hypothesis is true, we have a 5% chance of rejecting it even when we shouldn't if we're picking a 5% significance level. That is, of course, making a type 1 error. But it also goes to show you how arbitrary the 0.05 cutoff point is. And remember, 0.05 is selected as a significance level out of convention and because it's a nice clean number. There's absolutely nothing magic about it. Another important point here is that p-values are really only as meaningful as the setup that you did for your test. And to illustrate this, let's just use a really silly example. And keep in mind with this that the absolute most important assumption with a t-test is that you have a random sample that's truly representative of the population that you want to learn about. In my example about how much all Americans use their phones on average on a daily basis, I started with a null hypothesis of mu equals 3.5 against an alternative that mu was smaller than 3.5, but I could have very easily oversampled elderly Americans who probably don't use their phones very much, and I almost definitely would have come back with X bar much smaller than 3.5, so I would have gotten a very extreme test statistic and probably a very, very low p-value. Well, I do have a really low p-value, but it's because I don't have a random and representative sample, so the setup for my study is terrible and that p-value is meaningless. Now this is obviously a really extreme example, but this general principle should be in the back of your mind whenever you're interpreting a p-value as it relates to something that's practically significant. This brings us to misconception number four, which is that p-values are indicative of effect size or effect importance. And the key here is that there is a big difference between practical significance and statistical significance. And this is probably easiest to see in the case of having massive sample sizes. Let's say that we take a sample of size 500,000. And again, our null hypothesis is that the average number of hours Americans spend on their phones every day is 3.5 hours. Then we record our sample mean and our sample standard deviation at 3.49 hours and 1.2 hours respectively, plug these numbers into our trusty calculator, that is R, and we end up with a test statistic of T equals negative 5.893 and a p-value of 1.902 times 10 to the negative ninth. So an insanely small p-value over an effect size that, practically speaking anyway, is completely and utterly meaningless. It's for this reason that lots of people, and throw me into this boat too, don't like hypothesis testing as much as estimation procedures like confidence intervals. On one hand, the null hypothesis is 
always going to be at least a tiny bit wrong, even if you have this kind of tiny effect size that isn't meaningful in any kind of practical sense. But we're sort of glossing over the information about magnitude and effect size because we're boiling everything down to this binary significant versus not significant decision when alternatively you do gain more information by providing confidence intervals because those provide windows of plausible values that that thing that we're trying to learn about could live inside. At the end of the day, it does come down to your audience because some people do truly intuitively understand p-values and doing hypothesis testing can prevent serious unnecessary information overload. However, you do need to know your audience and sadly p-values are very commonly misunderstood and they are knowingly and unknowingly misused, especially by people who happen to have a stake in the outcome. So please use p-values and interpret them accurately and responsibly. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and you'd like to support my work, the best thing that you could do for me would be to share this video. Otherwise, leave a comment down below and let me know the worst example you've seen of p-values being misused. And then also consider smashing the like button too. Then I'll see you all in the not so distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.